Hare Krishna. It's grateful to be here amongst all of you today at the lotus feet of their lordships. And I'll speak in three parts today, tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening, on comparing Ramlila, comparing broadly the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And we will discuss various themes within it. The main theme I'll focus on is we'll compare the period of exile. So what caused it, how it developed, and ultimately how it concluded. One of the most universal and one of the most unsettling questions that human beings have had throughout history is why do bad things happen to good people? At one level, there are different philosophical explanations that can be given. But many times, truths are much better caught than taught. That means that if you try to in a didactic way, do this, don't do this, that is teaching. And that leads to some learning. But if we see somebody living those truths, then truth is much, much better caught by observing somebody doing some things. So the sacred texts of the Dharmic traditions, which is the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavatam, they address this question not so much by focusing on the philosophy. Philosophy is there, but they focus on not so much on what, why do bad things happen to good people, but what do good people do when bad things happen to them? What do good people do when bad things happen to them? And within this, give this mic. Am I audible to everyone behind? Okay. So, the way they address this is by demonstrating how even great characters go through difficulties, go through bad times. And generally, when we think of bad times, what does it mean? Basically, we all have certain things which bring some comfort and some security and some strength to our lives. And if those things are somehow taken away from us, often that is what we consider as a bad time. Uh, the most fundamental resources that we need for any comfort, security, strength is health. So if our health is taken away, we say, this is a terrible time I'm going through. Similarly, if our wealth is taken away from us, that's also a terrible time. If the things that are important for us are taken away from us, then that comprises a bad time. Basically, if we look at the world, we are here, the world is here. Now, we could say there is some kind of balance between uh, our position and the world's position. Say for example, right now, all of you are seated for hearing this talk. So there is a certain amount of balance and comfort that you are seated in a particular reasonably comfortable position. And although you do not specifically know what I'm going to speak, but there is a broad understanding that, okay, I'll be speaking something spiritual, scriptural, and maybe it will add some value to your life. That's why you are here. So when things are in an orderly way, that's when we can, we can function normally. But sometimes this balance is disturbed. That the balance between us and the rest of reality. Now that balance can be disturbed broadly in three ways. And that is what is in the tradition called as the three kleshas. The, which are the three kleshas? Adi Bhautik, Adi, Adi Atmik, and Adi Daivik. Yeah, thank you. So now, if we consider we are here, the rest of reality is here. 
Now, within the rest of reality, there are conscious agents, there are people, and there are forces which to us can seem unconscious. Say, for example, we don't see the consciousness directly, at least. Say, for example, if the weather becomes extremely cold and we are very sensitive to cold weather, then again, the comfort is disturbed. So if we, if we think in these two terms, these terms that the three kleshas, we are here, the rest of reality is here. Then the, the order or the balance between us and the rest of reality. Can this be fixed, bro? It's just going like this again. Your mind is doing I can hold it. But, okay. <clears throat> So this balance can be disturbed broadly in three ways. One is some conscious agents do something which hurts us. I mean, some person does something that troubles us, that torments us. Sometimes they may do it intentionally. See, this is going down. Maybe this way it is going down like this. I'm not sure whether that is. Otherwise, can you just lower this and it lifts? How long it might stay? Where does it lower further? Oh, okay. And so now. Until then, I will hold it. You take this time. Then you are going to. You are going to. I'm fine. So when this balance I'm talking about, we are here and the rest of reality is here. So now this balance can be disturbed by some people around us, conscious agents. That will be, you could say, uh, which clash? Adi Bhautik Klesh. Then, this balance can also be disturbed by forces which we don't see the consciousness. Like say, we might have a particular plan to do something, but somebody obstructs our plan. That's Adi Daibik, we could say. But if the weather goes completely incriminate, that is, which Klesh then? Adi Daibik. So the way we are interacting with the world, the way we are existing in the world, that can be disturbed in various ways. And the third could be that now Adhi Atmik, when we say, normally we talk about it as problems caused by the body and the mind. This is fine. Okay, thank you. So now, Adit Atmik Klesh, we may talk about as by our own, uh, our own, sometimes we fall sick, sometimes the mind gets disturbed. But we could also talk about Adi Atmik Klesh in terms of we ourselves sometimes do foolish things. So things are going on well in our life. But we make a terrible decision. And then again the order can get disturbed. So we are having a good relationship with someone. And somehow we do some, we speak some words because of a slip of tongue or because of some momentary anger. And they feel terribly hurt. And then things become destabilized. So basically, whenever this sudden destabilization of things happens, at that time, that's what we often call as a bad thing. So if you look at the Mahabharat and the Ramayana, I'll talk about Krishna Leela. You see, in the Mahabharat, Krishna's presence is there, but it is not, he's not the prominent presence. We'll talk about that also in due course. So there is order 
Ram is living in the kingdom. The Pandavas are living in their kingdom. There is order. Ram is about to be coronated. With respect to Yudhishthir, he is already coronated. That is, he has already done the Rajasuya Yagya. And he is established not only as the ruler of his own world, of his own kingdom. <coughs> He is not just a king, he is like an emperor. Kings from various parts of the world have come and offered him tribute. He is Rajasuya Yagya. And then, suddenly, both of them are exiled. So if we look at the cause of the exile, so it's it's unbearably bad thing to happen. Relatively speaking, <coughs> Say if we are supposed to get a good job and then somehow something happens and we lose that job. That's painful. But suppose we had got a job in a big company at a big position and then suddenly we lose it. So actually it's more painful. If we are anticipating to get something and we lose it, it's painful. But once we get something, often the we get more invested in it. And losing it is even more difficult. Of course, ultimately, it's very difficult to compare grief. Because grief is something which is very personally felt. And some event might seem from an analytical perspective, yeah, this is more painful than this. But from a personal, emotional, experiential perspective, the pain in that sense, see, when we have some back pain, or when we have some chronic pain. So what happens is, pain is always new for the experiencer, but it soon becomes old for the observer. So when, if I have back pain and I feel like, ah, it's, it's terrible. It's intensity, it's, it's pain. Although we, we may have experienced the sensation before, but still when it comes, it's unbearable. It's extremely painful. It can be excruciating. But if we tell somebody, oh, I'm having back pain, they may not say it. Eh, you have it every day. What's new? <laughs> <laughs> so, pain in that sense can't be quantified. And that's why it's very difficult to compare pain. But the point is that in this case, Yudhishthira was already established. Ram was about to be established. And then, when the, con when the whole... At one level, both Ramayana and the Mahabharata are intense family dramas. It's, it's a, most of the action happens within the family. Of course, whether you can call the Pandavas and Kauravas as one family, the kind of animosity the Kauravas had towards the Pandavas, that's open to question. But we'll come to that. So now when the conspiracy happens, so the mind is such a tricky thing that sometimes when something bad happens to us, at that time, if we uh, have not done anything wrong and still that bad thing happens upon us, then the resentment becomes unbearable. Why did this have to happen to me? I mean, Ram's case, there was absolutely no fault on his part. His father desired, and he was the eldest son. So it was a natural progression that he would become the king. And he, that he accepted. He did not seek it. He did not plot for it. He did not pressurize his father for it. His father himself desired it. But somehow, that action was seen by Kai Kai as a threat to her position. And because of that, especially, she saw that as a threat because of mantra. See, every action that we do, see, right now I am speaking. So, each, all of you are hearing, but based on your background, based on your current experiences, based on your knowledge, each of you will take some different points home. So, we may do one action, but different people are affected differently by that action. It's a two eyes two eyes may share the same, may see the same view, 
but two minds take a different view the view physically is the same but the perception is very different and because of that kai kai conspired and she just decided that i have to take things in my hands and she had ram exiled in the forest for 14 years and she insisted that bharat become the king now in contrast so this was of course traumatic but at the very least we could say all this the special we could say the betrayal that didn't happen in public that kai kai told dashrath and ram was called and actually dashrath couldn't even speak those words that he had to go to the forest so then kai kai only spoke those words and then of course the news came out but for the pandavas it was even more traumatic because everything happened in the public it is the betrayal in which first they were pressured into a gambling match and then this one by one by one everything started being stolen away from them it was lost but the match itself was rigged and that's why it's all like stealing and eventually when draupadi was attempted to be dishonored that was like a final straw and then eventually they were exiled to the forest so ram went to the forest and the pandavas went to the forest now were the terms of the two exiles same or different the terms what are the terms in the ramayana 14 years 14 years okay and in the mahabharat any of the kids 13 13 years something more something special in that kids <laughs> okay so yeah anything more about the 13 years <coughs> yeah as i said one year incognito now why like this why the difference it's all based on context so bharat uh, the idea of kai kai now kai kai personally had nothing against ram she did not hate ram she just she had her own version of how she loved bharat and she felt that ram is coming in the way so mantara told kai kai that if ram is in the kingdom so if she said she also anticipated dashrath maharaj also begged he said if you want varad to become the king fine i accept that but don't send ram away how has he hurt what harm has he ever done to you and how can he is my son i have as much duty to take care of him as varad how can i send him away so mantara had manipulated kai kai he told her that if ram is in the kingdom varad will never accept the king and even if bharat accepts the citizens of the courtiers will not accept so you have to send ram and by 14 years if in 14 years bharat will prove his competence and when he will win over the trust of the citizens and the courtiers then if ram comes back will not be a threat generally in the world whenever controversies break up are they breaking news we see so whenever controversies come up they are sensational and everybody starts talking about the controversies <clears throat> and especially people like to gossip you know what is gossip or when does gossip begin the gossip begins when we hear something we like about someone we don't like <laughs> we hear something we like about someone we don't like oh really okay yeah. everybody thinks we are such a good person now i know something now i would tell everyone about this so generally controversy start 
and these are getting broadcasted and it's especially now with the internet available you know one rumor if somebody has it can just go across the world even before the person speaking the rumor has completed uttering it also it's it's a, it can be a very dangerous age but still generally every controversy lasts till the next controversy comes up <laughs> everybody is talking about something now but the world is something new comes up and once the gossip mills get something new to churn on they forget the old thing so all the injustice vantara's feeling was that okay if bharat establishes himself as the king then even if ram comes back that will not be a threat so in a sense kai kai had no agenda to cause pain to ram per se it was she just wanted to get ram out of the way so that her agenda of bharat becoming the king could be fulfilled so in war this is called as collateral damage that means the army wants to bomb a particular weapon center but then the civilians around it get wounded so in a sense kai kai had nothing against ram so it is collateral damage that ram had to go to the forest but in the case of the pandavas and the kauravas the kauravas wanted to cause pain to the pandavas the kauravas very much especially duryodhan wanted to humiliate and uh, denigrate the pandavas and the terms 12 plus 1 was arranged in a very cunning way the plan was that 12 years they will be in exile and that will be painful for them but one year incognito for celebrities like the pandavas would be almost impossible and duryodhan's plan was during the, he was constantly having spies follow the pandavas wherever they would go and especially in the 12th year he had spies constantly and he said within they will just not be able to disappear and if they are found during the incognito year what will happen again 12 plus 1 years so he he could have said that they will lose the kingdom forever but the point here is that actually they were it's if if somebody is in constant misery they learn to accept it and live with it but there is misery and then there is hope of relief from misery and then again there is misery and then their hope grows frustrated just like if somebody has a disease which is declared incurable then okay you just learn to live with the limitation caused by the disease but then somebody says that oh it can it can be cured and then you try to cure it and you try it and you say oh no it doesn't work again you lose hope and again you're living with that and then again somebody says it can be cured and again you lose hope so what happens by this is that it's it's much more painful at one level to be settled in misery is easier than to have hope of relief and then lose that hope so duryodhan had a very sadistic plan sadism is a psychological perversion but somebody delights in causing pain to others say we are walking on a crowded road and we are running to do some urgent work and our foot steps on some now that's as soon as we realize it oh i'm sorry so that's just incident but when somebody is sadistic they say their foot has stepped on someone they will deliberately raise their foot and bang it down to cause pain to that person so duryodhan wanted to cause maximum pain to the pandavas and that's why the system was 12 plus 1 and the first 30 days they will be detected and sent back and his plan was for the rest of their life he will do like that now when they went to the forest it was that at one level both of them were victims the pandavas were victims ram was also a victim 
But in the case, as I said, sometimes if some, we are not to blame at all, then we can feel very resentful to whoever caused that problem to us. But our mind is so tricky that sometimes if we have played a role, if we have somehow contributed to our downfall, <coughs> then our mind can start beating us. Beating us and beating us, beating us. So in the case of the Pandavas, it was we could say at one level Yudhishthir committed a mistake. Now it's complex. I mean, the word mistake indicates that it's like a multiple choice question, which option is right and the other options are wrong. In real life, the choices are not that simple. If what is right and what is wrong, it's not that easy to decide. But broadly speaking, this will be a uh, undercurrent of my uh, talks over the next three days. Do the characters themselves evolve? That means when we go through life, we all are shaped. We, are, we experience certain events and that causes certain changes in us. So we all have a certain value system based on which we operate. Now, whether that value system reflects real value or not, that is open to question. In somebody's value system, money may be supreme value. And for the sake of money, they may betray their loved ones, they may betray anyone. So we all have values, but not just values, we have a value system. Say, for example, somebody, okay, my bhakti is the top most my value system. My family is second. My, my job is third. My other relatives are fourth. We may not have consciously articulated the value system like this. But we all have certain value system within us. And for people like Duryodhan, his value system was that he was an eye specialist. Not an eye specialist, eye specialist. <laughs> I first, I only. <laughs> so he was all concerned only about himself and his pleasure. Uh, and was very self-centered. So we all have certain value systems. To have values is important. But life is so complex that our values alone can't guide us. We also need a system. That means a hierarchy of values. Hierarchy of values means that, okay, say for example, for me, my health may be important, but then my service is also important. Now, should I do my service at the cost of my health or should I take care of my health and do my service later? So here, when we talk about a value system, both things are important, but which is more important? So in now, in the case of Ram and the case of uh, Yudhishthir, See, their characters are in many ways similar. Ram is very virtuous. Yudhishthira is also very virtuous. And both of them are dharmic. So broadly speaking, there are two conceptions of ethics. Uh, that there is There are categorical ethics and there are contextual ethics. Categorical ethics means that this is a category of wrong. This is the category of right. Or in terms of our earlier value systems, this value is higher, this value is lower. And that is how it is, finally. So now, contextual ethics is that yes, there is a category of right and there is a category of wrong. But it's not that black and white. Sometimes context will determine what is right and what is wrong. Suppose, <coughs> suppose now speaking truth or speaking lies. Now in the category speaking is truth and speaking lies, which one is which one is right and which one is wrong? Yes, it's obvious. Speaking truth is right. That's in the right category. But suppose 
maybe there is some there are some violent violent rioters racist or other biased bigoted people they are chasing a friend of ours and a friend comes knocks on our please save me and we hide them in our basement somewhere and those rioters come and knock on the door is he here now what should we do at that time should we speak the truth what do you think no see here what has happened speaking truth is a value protecting life is also a value so now what has happened over here there is a conflict between values so then we need the right hierarchy of values the right hierarchy is protecting life is more important than speaking the truth that's how we will be able to save the person so if somebody operates by categorical ethics their idea is that whatever happens i will i will speak the truth that's categorical ethics so we will see that the pandavas and the kauravas especially your radha pandav ram and yudhishthir both operate initially based on categorical ethics what is the categorical ethic that we should always obey our elders our elders are to be unquestionably obeyed all the time so when ram he comes to know that dashrath wishes that i should go to the forest unquestioning lakshman opposes that is <laughs> lakshman is so angry at the injustice and he says that the king he so angry he doesn't even refer to dashrath as his father or his respectability the king and the king is blinded by desire for his for his youngest wife and that is why he is sending you away yes when a king is blinded by desire like this he doesn't deserve to be obeyed he is lost sense of his principles so ram says no i was there and my father did not get the slightest pleasure in doing this he did he is doing this <clears throat> not because of infatuation but because of obligation is what obligation says he had given this word to kai kai that i'll honor two bones of yours and says we have never heard of this where did this come about this is a, this is a story made by kai kai he says no so if my father is saying this it must be true says you don't have to obey him he is blinded by desire so ram says it was because of my father's desire that i was going to ascend the throne now is my father's desire that i leave the kingdom i will do that so he had ram had this for him the value is obedience to the word of the elders at all costs for yudhishthir also it was the same way when yudhishthir when the when the proposal for gambling came at that time yudhishthir's first thought was if we gamble we will also fight now why do you want to gamble but dhritarashtra had sent vidura and now yudhishthir honored dhritarashtra like a father figure this is uncle and he treated him just like a father So he said, "I cannot disobey him." And then again, when he came there, first thing he told Duryodhan is, "Why do you want to steal the? Why do you want to take away from me the wealth with which I am serving the Brahmans?" So Duryodhan just neglected. He says, "I am not going to take any wealth. We are just playing a game." But they all knew where it was going to go. So in this case, in the case of Rama, it was just his father told him to leave, and he left. but it is in the case of dhritarashtra or in the case of yudhishthir dhritarashtra in a sense constrained him to do something which was disastrous so generally what happens is if we are just told to do something and we do it then the idea is that general idea would be that those who tell us to do something they take the responsibility for it if some instruction is given by someone and then they are meant to take the responsibility if things go wrong but 
if they tell us to do something and then that is wrong and we do something wrong and then terrible things happen and then they blame us for that or they take no responsibility for that it's like we get trapped by it so overall the complex level of complexity in the mahabharat is much more it's one of the characteristics of kalyuga is upadrutaha upadrutaha is the minds are disturbed and one reason the minds are disturbed is life is so complex so in the ramayan times relatively speaking life is simple in by the time of mahabharat the ages are going further further now now we see that krishna says sakavalene hamata yogo nashta parantapa by the power of time the uh, the dharma is lost now krishna is telling about his times that means when we talk about the mahabharat krishna is not saying the mahatayama mahabharat is ideal dharmic time this is the time when dharma is lost and that's why i have come to restore the knowledge of dharma the point is that as complexity increases the the potential for the mind to get agitated increases so generally the way we manage our lives is by having some structure in our life structure means what that okay morning you do this afternoon you do this evening you do this so when we have structure then the for for the mind the complexity goes down but if there is no structure then there is so much complexity it becomes overwhelming it's suppose we have to send some message on our phone and then uh, each time it is sent now our private thing is just type, type the message and send it but each time if when we have to send a message the phone starts asking okay what font do you want to use what font size do you want to use you know okay do you want to have it underlined or highlighted or do you want to have this now, if you actually go to the font settings in a computer or a phone there are so many settings over there now if we had to choose all of that at each time it would become crazy we will not be able to do anything so what happens there is a structure okay this is the template this is the font this is the size just send the message so for the mind to function there has to be some structure the lesser the structure the more becomes the complexity and the more the complexity the more the mind can go wild so um, the 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 lesser the structure in our life the greater the rupture the mind can cause in our life it's like if i wake up in the morning and whole day i have nothing planned to do then the mind may say okay let's let's just surf the internet a little bit let's look at facebook let's look at love watch some video and then if we have nothing to do we might spend 10 hours just doing that and think what did i do why did i waste so much time so what happens complexity means the structures become lesser and lesser or we have to navigate through so many structures that it becomes difficult so in the mahabharat the complexity is much more so what happens over here you both ram and yudhishthir have the same value system that we should always obey our elders but in this case yudhishthir gets implicated into a wrong action and that wrong action snowballs up So, so eventually, it's no one blames Ram for what happened to him. See, there is some amount of satisfaction for the ego in playing victim. Oh, you know, life is so terrible. This happened to me. That happened to me. That happened to me. So one person, so one person, their life is so terrible, and another person comes. See, yeah, life is so terrible. So both of them are indulging in self pity, and they together have a pity party. <laughs> but it's no one blamed Ram. But in the case of Yudhishthir, what happened? Even the Pandavas at one time, Bhima got so angry. in the gam- in the gambling match itself bima told arjuna that you know these are the hands with which yudhishthir gambled these are the hands with which he gambled draupadi and because of his draupadi is being humiliated 
He said to Bhima said, Oh Arjuna, bring fire. I will burn these hands of Yudhishthira. At that time, Arjuna had to catch Bhima. Told him. Now he couldn't give any instruction to Bhima. Generally, you have to present things in a way that makes sense to people. So some people, their idea is, okay, this is the right thing. I tell you to do the right thing, do the right thing. It doesn't work like that. So what Arjuna does is also the expert. He says, Viva is furious with Yudhishthira. Now if Arjuna gives an updesh over there, he is our elder brother, we should obey him, we should respect him. Viva is not going to listen. So what Arjuna does is, oh brother, now, do not speak words that will increase the joy of Duryodhan. <laughs> and now Duryodhan is already delighted to see the Pandava's misery. And now if he sees the Pandavas are infighting among each other, that will increase his joy. And Bhima looks at Duryodhan and he just somehow controls himself at that time. The point here is that Yudhishthira got blamed for it. And Yudhishthira might say that actually I was I was only obeying my elders. But when we are responsible or when we are culpable for something, some calamity coming upon us, then our mind can attack us. It can just devour us, start beating us. You fool, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? So the mind is extremely dangerous. What the mind does is, first, it makes us do wrong. And after making us do wrong, then it beats us up for doing wrong. You fool, why did you do that? So, at that time, so I started by talking about these three kleshas. So, Adi Atmik Klesha means sometimes our mind starts beating us from there. You fool, why did you do that? Why did you speak like that? Why did you do like that? Now, it's important to take responsibility for our actions. But to constantly feel guilty, to start beating oneself up, that is not of, that is not of no use. Because ultimately, we are our only resource. We are our only resource. If we have to rise, it is we who have to raise ourselves. Others can help us, but it is we who have to raise ourselves. So, the difference between taking responsibility and blaming ourselves, whether it is telling others or others, it's uh, ourselves. Taking responsibility means, okay, this is a situation and I did something wrong and, and it is terrible. I should not have done it, but I did it. That's taking responsibility. But blaming ourselves is a constantly beating ourselves. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And that, so taking responsibility can be empowering. Okay, I did wrong. Now I do the right thing. But blaming ourselves can be disempowering because we just keep beating ourselves again and again. So in the forest, actually Yudhishthir, at, at one time Draupadi is so angry with Yudhishthir. See, all the Pandavas are, are terribly hurt, terribly angered because of the way they have been treated in exile. But among them, uh, Draupadi and Bhima feel the pain the most. Draupadi because she was humiliated, or at least she was attempted to be humiliated, and Bhima because he felt Bhima was so powerful, and especially when somebody powerful is put in a situation of powerlessness. It's extremely painful for them. Say, in, say in India, almost everyone loves cricket. So, a Indian cricket team starts losing. Then everybody feels very bad. But suppose there was, India had a star cricketer and he just before a very important match gets injured. And because he is not playing, the team is losing. So, he can play but he can't play. Then he will feel that pain much more than everyone else. So, similarly for Bhima, everything is happening and he he has the strength to pound Duryodhan to death. He has the strength to pound Dushasan to death. And he's left in a powerless condition. It's extremely painful. So at one time, Draupadi 
just lashes out against against Yudhishthir. So, so the Ramayana is much more hierarchical. Like I said earlier, uncritical, almost uncritical obedience to elders. In the Mahabharata also hierarchy is there, but the hierarchies are challenged. They are not rejected, but they are challenged. So Sita almost never questions Ram about anything. And she said never, never, she never explodes against Ram. But Draupadi is a different character. She, she, she gets angry. And when she gets angry, she, she says, how could you have gambled me like this? And there is an entire chapter in the Mahabharat where actually Yudhishthir gives moral instructions. And he say, what right does he have to give moral instructions? He is himself the cause of all the distress. But then Yudhishthir explains. He says that I was, I was obeying my elders. And then he admits that actually once we started gambling, I got carried away. And I got caught in the frenzy of the gambling. And actually, during the gambling, Arjuna signaled to the Yudhish to stop now. But Yudhishthir just dazed. Yudhishthir was thinking that I've lost everything. How will I take care of my brothers? I will take care of my wives. Look, I play one more and I'll regain things. So he said, I got caught away. So he does not blame the Dhritarashtra. It was Dhritarashtra's instruction to gamble. But Dhritarashtra was not that you gamble everything. But when the gambling frenzy took up, it just went everything got over. Everything, they lost everything. So in terms of, sometimes problems can come upon us because somebody else is out to hurt us. Sometimes problems come upon us that somebody is out to hurt us and we also do things which hurt us further. Or we do things which make it easy for them to hurt us. And then, at that time, it can be extremely painful. What do I do? So while this is happening, or while such a thing is happening, it's important that, um, now how can Yudhishthir maintain his composure? Now how can Yudhishthir he didn't give instructions. And actually, if you see that, he, he says that and then he says, I'll take, he gives philosoph moral philosophical instruction and he says that actually things happen by destiny and ultimately we are just puppets in the hands of destiny. He gives a lot of instructions. I won't go into all the instructions. But the point is, although Draupadi is angry with Yudhishthir, Draupadi doesn't condemn Yudhishthir to be a moral person or an irresponsible person. Why is that? Because she knows his heart. I'll conclude with one difference which I'll explore in tomorrow's class further as we discuss the incidents in the Mahabharat. But the point is uh, that I talked about this categorical ethics and there is contextual ethics. So categorical is, this is right and that is wrong. Contextual is, yes, this is right and this is wrong. But sometimes in context, things may be changed. Say for going back to the earlier example of always speak the truth. Now imagine if somebody takes this absolutely literally. If the Pandavas take it literally. Now the Pandavas have to stay in incognito exile. And if in the incognito exile, ask, somebody asks them, who are you? And they say, I am Yudhishthir. <laughs> that will just not work. So, uh, there, although speaking truth is important, but the very turn of the exile is such that you can't speak truth. So, if you live with categorical ethics, you just can't function. So when we have when we have the idea of categorical ethics, that doesn't mean I'm not saying that there are no categories. There are definitely categories of right and wrong, and it's important to respect these categories. But those who live with categorical ethics, they think that they think more or less that life is like a living life successfully is like cracking a computer code. Once you get this code, 
You just run according to code, the whole machine will go perfect. But life is too complex. And so, it's in, first, it's very important to understand right and wrong. So this is the category of right, this is the category of wrong. If you don't understand that at all, then we will stay in perpetual confusion. But after understanding right and wrong, then you have to understand that it's not just so simple. Sometimes what is right may well be wrong in particular contexts. And what is wrong may be right. So what happens is that by the time the, the Mahabharata war time comes up, Yudhishthir evolves from categorical ethics to contextual ethics. And I'll talk about this evolution in a future class. But this, when this evolution is happening from categorical ethics, this is right, this is wrong. To know, let's look at let's look at consequences. Let's look at let's look at context. Then we'll decide what is right and wrong. So, so there is this differentiation which needs to be carefully understood. And the epics basically are guidebooks for how to act. But they're not just guidebooks that do this, don't do this. That sort of guidebook may be useful for working with machines. But for working with conscious beings, it's not so much a rule book as a compass that we need. A rule book is do this, don't do this. A compass is okay. This is the direction in which you are meant to go. Now in this situation, how? what is the best way to go in this direction? Like when we are going in traffic. We may, this is the path I have to go. But Google may tell us, okay, this path normally would take you 25 minutes. But today with travel, it will take you 45 minutes. So another path takes you 35 minutes. It normally would avoid, but today it might be lesser. So if we have a compass, then we can choose the path. So what we need to learn from scripture is more of developing this compass. And in the Ramayana, Ram is exiled and he goes to the forest. And he's stoic about it. He doesn't, he doesn't complain about it. In fact, those who are complaining, Lakshman is complaining, Ram calms him, calms him down. When the Pandavas go to the forest, every one of them is furious. Every one of them is swinging their weapons in anger. And they are waiting for the 13 years to be over and they are all angry with the Kauravas to come and to hit them back for the humiliation that they have caused. When Ram goes to the forest, there is, there is agony, but there is not that much anger. When the Pandavas go to the forest, there is not just agony, there is anger. Because in this case, it's, as I said, in the case of Ram, Kaikir intentionally want to cause harm to him. But in this case, the Pandava, Kauravas deliberately wanted to count harm to him. And sometimes injustice happens in the world. But sometimes the injustice is incidental and sometimes the injustice is intentional. In, injustice is in, incidental means say some people have some homes at a particular place and say the road has to expand or the railway has to expand. Then those people's homes are taken up. And you say, ah, maybe they don't get an adequate compensation. That's bad. But, but it's not that the government is out to destroy those people. It's incidental that happens. But some, suppose the government is, say, racist or um, religiously fanatical or whatever, and they deliberately want to destroy, disrupt and destroy a community. And then they attack. And then they destroy. That is not, that is injustice, but it is intentional injustice, not incidental injustice. So the Pandavas are subjected to intentional injustice. And that causes far greater resentment and anger. And in tomorrow's session, tomorrow morning session, we'll discuss uh, how Ram and the Pandavas process this exile while they are in the forest. We won't go so much into all the dramatic actions, the fights and all that. That may be part of it, but the most focusedly will be how they internally process it. And how uh, we can also learn from that, how we process the difficulties in our own lives. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this theme of how 
we compared the exiles in the Ramayana and the Mah uh, in the Mahabharat. And within that, I talk about both the epics. They focus not so much on the question of why bad things happen to good people, but what do good people do when bad things happen to them? Uh, life truths, life lessons are better caught than taught. And in the, in the case of Ramayana, Ram was about to be enthroned as the prince regent and the king, whereas Yudhishthira was already enthroned. Not just as the king, but as the emperor of the world. So we could say comparatively, there's a far greater pain after having achieved something to lose it rather than to lose it before you achieve it. But then pain is not quantifiable. So it's painful for whoever goes through it. And then in, we elaborately talk about that when some, some bad thing happens to us, broadly speaking, we are here, the rest of reality is here and there is some balance. And bad thing happen means the balance is disturbed. Whatever is things we need for living with, with comfort, with safety, with strength, they are suddenly disrupted. So that can happen either through conscious agents in the outside world, that's Adhidaivik Klesh, with through agents whose consciousness we can't see, like natural disturbances, that's Adhidaivik Klesh, and through our own mistakes, then it's Adhyatmik Klesh. So Adhidaivik, we just understand you're helpless. It's relatively easier to accept that. Adi Bhautik causes resentment. Why is this person doing this to me? But Adi Atmik, where it's because of our own mistakes, then it's not just anger against others, it's anger against oneself. It can be the most difficult to process. So in the case of Ram, the sentence of exile was straightforward, 14 years. And Ram being sent to the forest was more like a collateral damage. Neither Mantara nor Kaikai wanted to harm Ram per se. They just wanted him to get out of the way. But in the case of the Kauravas, the Pand they wanted to cause as much pain to the Pandavas as possible. And that's why the idea of 12 plus 1. And the one they were almost sure, the one year of incognito exile, they would surely be found. And then again they would have to go. So not just constant misery, but misery with hope of relief and again misery. Again hope of relief, again misery. That way the misery can be maximized. So now we all act according to certain values which we may or may not have articulated. So the values we talked about is with respect to values, there can be categorical ethics where this is right and this is wrong or there can be contextual ethics. And yes, this is right and wrong, but let's look at the context. So with respect to Ramayana and the Mahabharat, one value which they all follow is a submission to elders. And that's why Ram uncritically accepts going to the forest and Dashrath sends him. And Yudhishthir also agrees to fight the gambling match, play the gambling match. But <clears throat> while he is doing this, <clears throat> Ram is just like, he <clears throat> is sent to the forest. It's not that he does anything wrong. So nobody blames him. Whereas Yudhishthir, he is made to do something which then snowballs into something <coughs> where he ends up getting blamed. So we all need to take responsibility for our actions, but there's no not much use in blaming ourselves. The spring responsibility is empowering. I did wrong, I won't repeat it. Blaming ourselves is constantly beating ourselves. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And that is disempowering. Ultimately, even if we have committed any mistakes, we are our only resource to correct the mistakes also. And if we are, uh, beat ourselves up, we won't be able to continue. So Yudhishthir, although it's a grievous mistake and he admits that I got carried away while gambling, but he regains his composure. And he's able to give instructions to even Draupadi by which she calms down. So while the, uh, I talked about how the, in the Mahabharata, the complexity is much more. And complexity often can cause agitation to the mind. Complexity means there's no clear navigable structure. And the lesser the structure in our life, the greater the rupture the mind can cause. So because of the Mahabharata's complexity, what is a right and wrong can become much more difficult to discern. But both of them go to the forest. The Ra Ram goes... Everybody's in agony, but Ram goes peacefully. 
the Pandavas go furiously. And how they process the time of exile, we'll discuss in tomorrow's session. Are there any questions or comments? Was Yudhishthir also as angry as the rest of the Pandavas? Was Yudhishthir also as angry as the rest of the Pandavas? When they were sent to exile, you said like there was there was not a agony as well. Yes, definitely. Yudhishthir was also. Uh, it's natural to feel anger, but it was not as vehement. Bhima's anger was very very obvious. He was. Uh, Yudhishthira's anger was more restrained. We all have nature, we all have natures, and we all express our anger also in according to our natures. So there's definitely anger. The in the Mahabharata there's a description of how Vidura tells Dhritarashtra that all the Pandavas are going waving their weapons, and he reveals Dhritarashtra gets agitated. He says, "What is going to happen to my sons now?" So at that time he's describing Yudhishthira is angry. But his anger is not as explicit as Bhima's. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. So we talk about the complexity in the structure. So sometimes it feels like uh, working in a corporate. Sorry? Working in a corporate environment. What structure do you Okay, it's a good question. Sometimes too much structure can also lead to complexity. Yeah, it's like if say you have to do one thing, you have to get sanction from ten different people. Then it just becomes too messy. <clears throat> this is an important question. See, we all need some kind of structure in life. This is is a whole big subject. I just try to make it as simple as possible to understand. You know, in politics, we use the word right wing and left wing, or right and left. So basically, the idea is that the right are conservative, the left are liberal. And the idea within the right is that there are structures in society, and these structures have evolved and developed after centuries and centuries of thought. And we need to be careful to preserve the structures. Whereas the left feels these structures are oppressive. And just bring down the structures so that everybody can have equality. So now who is right? Again, it depends on context. At one level, structures is necessary because not everybody is equal in their competence. Say, suppose um, after this program, you know, we had to cook food. Now, if we say, let everybody have equal right to cooking the food. Well, equality is fine. But if somebody is better at cooking than others, then let them take the lead. If the if we form a hierarchy within the team, if that hierarchy is based on competence, then that hierarchy benefits everyone. If somebody knows what they are doing and they direct everyone else, and everybody will else, everybody will get good food. So structure for doing anything significant, anything uh, worthwhile, structures are helpful. But the structure needs to be based on competence. Just like traditionally Varanashram was based on competence. Guna, Karma, Bhavacha. The Brahmanas were at the top because the society was overall structured for spiritual growth. And the Brahmanas were most serious about spiritual growth. They were themselves spiritually also advanced and they were also most serious about pursuing spiritual advancement. So it was based on competence. But then the Brahmanas forgot about spiritual advancement and they started claiming material privilege because of their high worth. Then what happened? The same structure which was supposed to be based on competence became based on operation. And then that structure needs to be uh, needs to be modified or sometimes replaced, sometimes rejected. 
so basically structure brings order to life but sometimes this the structure becomes distorted and every hierarchy tends to tyranny that is just the nature of human psychology when you get power it's easy to abuse power so every hierarchy tends towards tyranny so the right always is emphasizing the importance of structures and the left always emphasizes the plight of the underprivileged the plight of those who are oppressed by the structures so for example any say now the feminist movement has become very strong so oh, men were exploiting women for so long and now women are going to assert their rights yes it has happened that there were women who were abused by some abusive men not some maybe many but still the point is that it is not that throughout history men were abusing women a life is tough and man and woman were cooperating in the best possible way to deal with the tough tough difficulties that life brings on them with the difficulties that life brings in them but so if we just reject the structure then what happens society becomes destabilized and uh, now one of the biggest problems is that now we have single parent families or people just don't have children and a lot of problems come up when you just reject structure so the i do make a long answer short now that structures are important but sometimes the structures can become overbearing if they are based not on competence but simply on oppression on domination so that is happening on the structures who need to be modified but it's what is required is modification of the structure not rejection of the structure so it's similarly for us also to do things in life structures can sometimes give a pathway okay this is how you should do things but sometimes the structure can just obstruct the path and then things need to be changed accordingly does it answer your question okay. any other questions yes so when we are going to the pain not because of your own mistake but you you are put into that situation how do we process it do you think that because of our karma or how do we okay mm-hmm. yeah i was going to answer this question tomorrow but i'll answer it brief are there any other questions based on today's class there is an answer okay is it okay i'll answer tomorrow then yes sir So this is a lecture like as a grasta what should i learn from it what should i apply in my life to today's lecture okay okay as a grasta what should i apply to today's class like uh, we are talking of uh, the kind of uh, and uh, now we are in the loop basically so that we can engage more or less and more than that so, okay how to apply this principle of what we are talking about today in our daily day to day life so what, how do we apply the principles in day to day life today yeah it's broadly as i said it's more a developing of a compass rather than getting a set of rules so like uh, we might have i talk about categorical ethics we might have said like, this is what i have to do and this is this is how things are but sometimes our experience might tell us that categorical ethics do not work i may have to look at context so basically for some of us for many of us complexity has definitely increased life is uh, life was much simpler when apple was just a fruit <laughs> <laughs> so now to deal with so many complex situations but broadly if you understand that there is uh, first there are no easy answers it's we have to develop our compass and then let me study scripture and understand scripture. this is the scripture and the philosophy and this is our reality so we need to understand scripture carefully we need to understand our reality carefully and then we have to see how best to apply 
So as I said, that how do good people respond? That's what we focus on. So the Pandavas, they did not, neither Pandavas nor Ram became violent immediately. The Pandavas, they were they suffered a lot, but they will see that they tried their best to although they were angry, they will, they tried their best to resolve things in an amicable way. And I would say the most important lesson that we can learn is that we are not alone in our suffering. Distress is democratic. <laughs> Distress is democratic. It comes upon everyone. Even people who are far more virtuous than us, even they have to suffer. So, the, the, so that itself, recognizing that uh, everybody is going through difficulties, that makes sure that our mind doesn't compound our misery. The way the mind works is, is the mind gets us alone and then gets us. So it makes us think, nobody is suffering like the way you are suffering. And for nobody, life is unfair the way it is for you. Nobody has been victimized the way you have been victimized. Okay, it may feel like that, but there are so many people. Well, far greater people than us have suffered far more than us. That's why that if we could avoid that self-pity and self uh, that resentment that comes because of that. So, and then we can try to so our whole understanding purpose of this talk was to understand how do good people, good people respond. So one thing we can say is that, that even if they have not done anything wrong or even if they have done a small thing wrong and a terrible wrong I think happens because of that. They process it. They don't become violent. They don't become uh, they don't become vindictive. Uh, they don't collapse under self-loathing. So they are able to be resilient. This is what the resilience is a very strong, very important virtue in life. See, there is, we, if we, we can't always be consistent, but we can always be resilient. Consistency means the way we are functioning, that's the way we always function. But it's very difficult. Life has its storms. So con consistency means steadiness at the same level. But resilience means even if you're knocked down, we rise up, we bounce back. So for the Yudhishthir, there was a lapse, a grievous lapse. And it was a lapse of judgment which had serious I and mean, devastating consequences. But we see Yudhishthir's resilience by which he bounces back. And he again uh, comes back to his dharmic nature. So that resilience is also something we can learn. Broadly speaking, how we can further develop that compass that we'll discuss in future sessions. Thank you. Yes, from uh, You mentioned that uh, during the uh, time of Ramayana, uh, because Dharma was stronger, so Rama could afford to be following more of categorical attitudes. Yeah. As opposed to, let's say, during... So as life becomes more complex, dharma goes down, do we need to follow more contextual value system than categorical? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that, or no, no, I'll let me take no in, the, no in the sense that the categories still remain. And we need education in the categories. Some people even say that actually there is no such thing as right or wrong. There is what is called as ethic moral relativism. Moral relativism is the idea that you know, what you feel think what you feel is right is right for you. What I feel is right is right for me. So I was speaking in a, at Intel in I think in the Bay Area. So after this, somebody asked this question. You know, ultimately, how this it's all relative. Right and wrong. So then I asked them that are 
are there is there anything in the world right now that is being done by someone that you feel is wrong so of course there are terrorists who are killing innocent people there are sexual predators who are abusing children and so many things said do those people think they are doing wrong the jihadis they they believe that they are actually doing the will of god really now when we when we practice whatever we practice in the name of our faith that is we are meant to become spiritual fruits but some people become religious nuts <laughs> so now they actually believe that it is right thing so no but that's wrong they're killing innocent people but they don't think so that means that irrespective of somebody's thinking there are things which are right and there are things which are wrong so we can today's idea is that we go so much towards moral relativism that all moral categories are just as is constructed by some people uh, but it's not like that there are there are there are moral absolutes also now specifically what is a moral absolute and what is not a moral absolute that is something which we may we may discuss but it's important to recognize the categories we can't just casually dismiss the categories we recognize the categories and we also recognize the context we also recognize the context that means that we have to see okay this person is here what is the step forward from them in their for them in their context so prabhupad <clears throat> prabhupad was with ambarish prabhu alfred ford or ambarish prabhu and he said no, so prabhupad asked him are you preaching to your your people in your social your social circle he said yes so how is it he said prabhupad when i tell them about the four regulative principles they don't like it then prabhupad then don't tell them about it and we say what do you mean they don't tell them about it see it basically if that is going to take them away from krishna then we have to tell them something which will attract them in any area of uh, area where we are sharing something so suppose apple comes up with a new phone you what is it apple x11 or what is it now 11 pro 11 pro Okay, so Apple Eleven Pro comes up. Now imagine if there is any promotion. Will that promotion begin with the price? No. He say, oh, this pass, this much memory, this much this, this feature, this feature, this feature, and then after you see all the features, <laughs> then finally, my conscious part. What has happened? Seeing the features <laughs> creates the desire. and then after that okay the price maybe we will be worth it so in any time if we want somebody to buy we don't tell them the price we tell them the features so similarly with respect to us we have to be contextual in the sense that if this person is here what is the way that they can come closer to krishna what that we have to see we can't just uh, think of sharing anything with anyone or acting in our lives without considering context so yeah we don't undermine categorical categories moral categories but at the same time we also give due role to the due importance to the context okay so thank you very much shri prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki Thank you, Gaurav Premanand. Thank you.